Yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, I just wanted to um, I put in the chat uh, a link for the White House Environmental um, Justice Advisory Council. There's some information there. I think our Urban Water Federal Partnership fits well in with that uh, with that initiative. It's a public uh, or it's a, uh, allows for public input. So just wanted to get that out there. And I really just briefly wanted to welcome all uh, the speakers. Uh, they are some of our strongest uh, partners uh, over the, the time in our Urban Water Federal Partnership, uh, especially in our Brownfield community of practice. Um, they aren't the only projects uh, occurring in our area. And, um, you know, we are working on uh, updating our work plans and such. So, you know, we, we wanna encourage other sites, other ideas, you know, that's part of it. But we think these projects really highlight really well um, a lot of what we're trying to achieve here and uh, and really thankful for these projects and partners. They've brought a lot of success uh, and visibility to our region. So uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to my co-chair real quick, uh, Frank McLaughlin, uh, and see if he has anything to say and then we'll get right to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Simeon, and, and, and thank you, Emily, for all your work putting this together. And, and, and thank you also to our, um, our other speakers and uh, all the participants who uh, joined today. We need all of us working together to address the long-standing environmental and social justice problems we have in our cities. And if we are going to... Um, hope to handle things like uh, climate change and, uh, you know, uh, and, and bringing our country to the place where it needs to be. Uh, we need to focus on our most distressed communities and our most vulnerable people. And uh, it's so great to have a partnership, an urban waters partnership to do that. And it's greatly enhanced the work we've been trying to do at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection on the other side of the river in Camden. And, and across uh, the state. So uh, thank you to, to the speakers and participants. And we look forward to having a great dialogue today and continue on because we have a lot of work to do in our urban waters and our communities that, that are adjacent to them. Great, thanks so much, Frank. Um, and with that, I'm actually gonna be turning it back over to you. So our first. <laughs> set of speakers today are going to be giving us some updates from Camden, New Jersey. So we'll be hearing from Frank McLaughlin and David Bean with New Jersey DEP. And so I'm going to go ahead and... So please yeah, share, share the your... slides, Emily. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, they don't want to see me. They want to see uh, the slides from Camden, I'm sure. And if you need assistance, I have a backup set of slides, but you probably don't. Oh, here we go. Awesome. Good. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, everybody, for your patience. Problem. So my name is Frank McLaughlin. I work at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. I've had the great pleasure to be um, an honor, really, to be assigned to Camden, New Jersey for the last 18 years, even though I now manage a group. Um, in the Office of Brownfield and Community Revitalization. Uh, one of my close colleagues who I've worked with many years, uh, Dave Bean, will be speaking in a few moments about uh, a project right in the foreground here, the former Harrison Avenue landfill, the, the, the largest contaminated site in, um, in the city of Camden. And you can see it abuts the Delaware and Cooper Rivers and is connected to our region. So what happens at one site in Camden or one pipe in Philadelphia affects all of us in the region. So that's why we need to focus on our urban areas because that's where the people are most concentrated, but also where our environmental issues are also most concentrated. Next slide. So this, this busy slide just shows some of the, the environmental challenges we have in the city of Camden. The blue dots are, are actually air. Uh, major air sources. Um, I couldn't even put on the known contaminated sites because it actually overwhelmed the so slides. Uh, it also has uh, the CSO uh, discharge points. Um, we have maybe 21 or 22 in the city of Camden. 
Um, you can see also, um, we put the 100 year floodplain uh, superimposed on the city and you can see that the city is gonna, is already very vulnerable to uh, stormwater and pluvial flooding and is also uh, being challenged by uh, tidal flooding as well. So this, this city, like many other cities, has um, not received the attention it deserves from, from my agency in the past and also from other state federal agencies. And, and, and let's face it, also from nonprofits, from uh, local institutions, from businesses too. So we're all in this together and having partnerships of multi-levels of government, the, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, this is how we're gonna be addressing the many challenges in Camden City and our other cities in the region. Next. So New Jersey just passed the first of its kind in the country environmental justice law and deputy commissioner of the DEP, Olivia Glenn, gave a uh, robust uh, discussion of that in our last webinar. And uh, it's only possible because of our, uh, our leadership uh, by Governor Phil Murphy and our New Jersey legislature to help strengthen our efforts in environmental justice communities in New Jersey. An environmental justice community has disproportionate environmental stressors or burdens. It also is defined demographically by elevated poverty, high minority percentage, and also limited English proficiency. And the third thing, which often is overlooked, but it actually was pivotal to much of our work in Camden over the years is the lack of environmental and public health benefits. What is not well known um, to, to many is that places like Camden have less open space, more dense, higher density people, but less opportunities for open space. And a riverfront like city like Camden nearly lacked robust access to it's beautiful Delaware, Delaware River, which makes its western boundary. So, so we need to think environmental justice, not of just the problems, but the lack of opportunities and lack of benefits specific to the environment. And we need to reconnect our urban residents to the environment, just like we need to connect all people to our, our, our wonderful natural resources. Next. So this busy slide uh, shows um, the many pictures uh, in the many different neighborhoods in Camden. And um, one of our focus has been, how do we turn environmental stressors into environmental benefits in Camden? And Camden has um, a, a deteriorated combined sewer system with very serious repetitive stormwater flooding. And um, we decided many years ago that the many abandoned contaminated sites we call brownfield sites, and you see some pictures on your screen there, would be the perfect places, not only to, to revitalize the communities because they were the center of blight, but also to manage chronic stormwater flooding. And we have a pretty impressive portfolio of successful projects. And we're only gonna be able to speak to two of them today, uh, the Harrison Avenue Landfill Project and the former American Minerals uh, site. Uh, but what, what I would say to our audience here is that communities are, are, are diverse and they're also complicated from an environmental, demographic and social components. And if we want to serve our urban communities better, we need to meet them where they are. Go into the cities, go into the individual neighborhoods, work with the local community leaders. And uh, part of our success in, in, in the state of New Jersey and work in Camden is exactly that, where we showed up where the problems are in our neighborhoods at the sites you see on our screen. Next. So this is the Brownfields uh, 
community of practice, and uh, it, it has always had an, an environmental justice uh, lens because brownfields are typically located in struggling, struggling neighborhoods and are often the center of blight in neighborhoods. In Camden, not only is it bad enough to have a, an abandoned gas station or abandoned factory, but these are places also that attracted other illegal activities from illegal dumping to, uh, to drug sales and many other illegal activities. So these brownfield sites are actually the worst places in our struggling neighborhood, let alone also a source of contamination and significant stormwater runoff. Um, uh, Philadelphia was really the first city to take the, take a lead on impervious surface coverage, and uh, we found the same problems in Camden. And, and Brownfield site is like a it's it is like an asphalt parking lot that's contaminated. So it's really a, a double problem: not only a a contaminated stormwater runoff, but also a volume issue. About a million gallons a year per acre run off brownfield sites much like like asphalt like underproductive uh, asphalt sites um another reason why we need to focus on brownfield sites is also that brownfield redevelopment actually reduces stormwater runoff obviously development in our suburban and rural areas increases runoff to our main stem of the delaware river but brownfield redevelopment takes impervious surface coverage in buildings like you see and can turn them into better stormwater management, green infrastructure, green roofs, storage, and, and we've empl employed all these methods in the city of Camden. And of course, brownfield sites are, are typically located uh, along waterways, so it's a great opportunity. Next slide. So one of, one of our uh, key uh, projects was in the Waterfront South neighborhood, actually the poorest neighborhood in the poorest city of New Jersey. No meaningful access to the beautiful Delaware River since the 1880s. That's not a misprint. That's when this, that, that's when this neighborhood uh, waterfront developed. And it was primarily, this is where the shipbuilding center of Camden was, uh, New York shipyard. Um, Um, abandoned, much of it abandoned, but still inaccessible to the residents of uh, Waterfront South or the Camden region. In 2013, we, we developed, we, we uh, formalized a unique partnership called the Camden Collaborative Initiative with our federal partners at EPA Region 2. Uh, also included uh, our county partners led by the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority. The city, the city of Camden, and one of our nonprofits, uh, Cooper Surrey Partnership. What was unique about this partnership, in addition to the multiple levels of government and working with the nonprofit sector, was we empowered local stakeholders and residents with decision making. Now, there's a lot of talk about partnerships and collaboration, but it, it's only truly effective again when you when you meet the folks where the problems are and also empower them with decision making and input into plans and and sharing data and uh, i'm proud to say that the Camden collaborative initiative was recognized by by epa uh, we won an environmental champion award for the best public private partnership in 2016. next slide And this is, this is the Phoenix Park site. It's located right adjacent to the Camden County Municipal Utility Authority, the third largest wastewater treatment plant in the state. And um, we opened up the park in 2016 to local residents. Again, the first meaningful access to the waterfront South community in over a hundred years. And not only was this a great uh, social justice and environmental justice project, but it also benefited Delaware River because no longer was more than 5 million gallons of, a year of, of contaminated stormwater entering the Delaware River. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of the 
the entire Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority plant, again, the third largest wastewater treatment plant in the state. It's about a 60 million gallon a day uh, dry weather uh, treatment plant. To the uh, right is Phoenix Park after we uh, demolished the building. And in front is a, our, our next phase of the project, which is building in community resiliency, protecting not only the community, but the critical wastewater treatment plant from sea level rises and storm surges. Next slide. This is a rendi this is a, a, a rendition to the to the right of what um, our design when it's funded. It's about a million dollars to build a uh, living resilient shoreline in front of the wastewater treatment plant in Phoenix Park. And the current conditions are on the um, on the left, and and that is obviously for people who are knowledgeable about the Delaware River, uh, this looks like a typical urban waterfront to the left and it is, but it could be, it could be much better. And I would be, and, and I have to say that uh, the partnership for Delaware Estuary has been a tremendous partner, not only in our Brownfields community practice, but at this site and uh, helping us understand the water quality and resiliency be benefits of freshwater mussel systems uh, in the, in the, in the tidal freshwater section of the Delaware River where Camden is located. Next slide. So the next project we're gonna focus on in Camden that, that, that my uh, colleague David Bean will speak about in a moment is the Harrison Avenue landfill. There's an aerial photo of it. And um, this is, is a former city dump, 86 acre landfill that was filled 86 acres, that's like 86 football fields of garbage that was filled 50 feet high in spots, spilling literally into the Delaware River and into the adjacent Kramer Hill community. So talk about a historic environmental injustice, a 50 foot high, 86 football field wide garbage dump that was never even covered by the city of Camden when it ceased operation in 1971. Next slide. And this is this is this is what in, in, in well, this is a picture taken in 2012. My office started working on this project in about 2004. In 2006, we we received amazing news from the estate of Joan Croc, who uh, bequeathed 1.6 billion dollars to the Salvation Army and. Camden was one of 26 lucky cities to receive a Croc Community Center. And this led to the state, my program, putting $30 million towards making that happen. But this is a cut of the landfill face that you see across the street from, a neighbor, from the Kramer Hill neighborhood. And uh, we have, again, critical to wanting to work more closely with urban partners, meeting them where you are. We didn't have any meetings in Trenton. All of our meetings were in Camden. We met continuously. We were transparent with information. And um, as a matter of fact, we were so, we, we were so helpful that the Kramer, Hill neighbor, the, the Kramer Hill leaders asked me to be part of developing a neighborhood plan because it was so reliant on landfill and brownfield redevelopment to, to, to reconnect this two mile long community along the Delaware that was also isolated from the river. Next slide. And this is a, this is a, this is a picture of the remediation of about 2012. The Croc, the, the Croc Center, which, was, which opened in 2014, would be to the left of this picture. The the sands to the left being pushed by that bulldozer came actually from the Delaware River. So the, the, it's amazing that the Croc Community Center, the landfill, the, the foundation of the Croc Community Center and the cover for the landfill is reused materials from the Delaware River ch shipping channel. Um, you can see the community right across the street and uh, to, the, to the right, we are excavating garbage out and relocating it to the center of landfill, which, which now has uh, playing fields underneath it. Next slide. 
And now you're going to hear the rest of the story, the phase two story of this amazing transformation of an 86 acre landfill. The, the Finnish Croc Community Center is in the foreground. The uh, David Bean, my, my colleague uh, who has worked with me and the community since about 2008 is going to tell the rest of the story. And of course, you see the Delaware Cooper River and the city of Philadelphia in the background. So that's why a project like this is so important. And and Dave and I are going to be available for questions um, at the end of at the end of the talks today to to give you a little more idea of how we secured funding and how um, we work with local or local stakeholders to get projects like this done. Next slide. Okay. Uh, thank you, Frank, <clears throat> and hello, everyone. Um, just uh, a few words about. Uh, the Office of Natural Resource Restoration, for those of you that don't know, um, our office really has, has two branches. Uh, we have a branch that pursues um, natural resource damages from responsible parties that have injured natural resources. And, uh, and we, we try to get restoration of natural resources uh, to offset that injury. And that restoration can, can occur in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, it's it's fine with us if the responsible party wants to take on that responsible part that uh, restoration, but in some cases, uh, the responsible party prefers to cash out, and when that happens, uh, we are able to to go forward and and implement projects such as the one you're you're about to see here. Um, so this is uh, this this cover page here is is a shot across one of our observation platforms. Um, and in the background, you can see the Ben Franklin Bridge and the city of Philadelphia skyline. And you see the, uh, there's, a, there's a huge um, tidal flat with, with spatter dock um, in the foreground. The, the river that comes in from the left is the Cooper River. And of course, the, on the right-hand side, you, can, you, you have views out to the Delaware River and the back channel of the Delaware. Uh, next slide. So here's a brief history. Um, Frank, uh, Frank covered, covered most of this already, but uh, this was um, a solid waste landfill on 86 acres, and it ran from 1952 to 1971. The landfill was never closed or capped. It remained uncapped uh, until we took over the project. Remedial efforts began in 2006 um, with the Croc Center, 24 acres. Um, we got that 24 acre piece with the Salvation Army Croc Center on it, which is a huge, huge benefit to the community. And our hope is that that the project that, that we're doing will work uh, you know, synergistically with the with the Croc Center, um, so we're I, we're pretty excited about that. Um, our office does do um, tracks the project. You know, we fund the project. Uh, we are very involved in the concept formation, the design, the bidding of the project, and then the construction oversight. And our project uh, is sixty two acres. And uh, this particular project, most of the funding for this actually came from an MTBE uh, settlement. And uh, you know, this is uh, this project is really well suited uh, for for NRD funding, and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. So, forty eight million dollars uh, was allocated to design, construct, and manage the project. Um, all of the funding is from natural resource damage settlements. There's no other money uh, in play here, uh, the, no tax dollars in, in use. Um, I don't know if you'll actually be able to appreciate this, but 375,000 cubic yards of material was, was moved on site. Um, and if you think about this in, in dump trucks, you know, you get 15 yards in a, in a big dump truck. So this is, this is just a, an absolutely huge amount of, of material that had to be moved. Um, 
and you know all of the material with the exception of tires uh virtually all of the material uh was was used on site recontoured uh to provide uh habitat as well as as human points of interest which you'll see and uh, a few more numbers you know almost 380,000 plants have been planted out there and uh we we've got um 300 or uh, 3200 linear feet of shoreline stabilization and a lot of that is is living shoreline uh, even in the even in the areas that have riprap and whatnot we went to the extra trouble of of putting live stakes in the riprap so that 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 riprap will in all likelihood eventually be be consumed by plants uh, so it'll still be there it'll still be doing its job but it, it'll be uh, hard to recognize next slide please so uh, when, when you do a project like this, you cross paths with, with a lot of different organizations, uh, among them the Delaware River Basin Commission. And before this was closed, before we did this project, they had actually modeled that there was nine grams of PCBs coming off of this landfill every day. So uh, PCBs are, are one of those nasty contaminants that that does biomagnify and bioaccumulate uh, in the food chain, and it's a human carcinogen. So one of the many benefits of taking on a project like, is, like this is that we can stop that, that discharge and others uh, when, when we're done. Next, sli next slide, please. Oh, by the way, that was, that slide, uh, that was pre-construction. Um, and you could, you could kind of see the uh, landfill material subject uh, to wave energy and whatnot. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, one of the first things that we have to do, and when you have a landfill that's, that hasn't seen activity since the 70s, uh, you, do, you do get vegetation that grows there, including trees. Um, so one of the first things we have to do, you know, if we are going to make this, make this site safe for uh, humans and, and biota alike, uh, we've got to put a, we've got to, we've got to put a barrier between the contamination and, and the habitat. Uh, and in order to do that, we've got to cut down almost all of the trees. We did leave um, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a tuft of trees, as well as the bottom right-hand corner, there's another tuft of trees. These were um, areas, when we were going through the permit process, uh, we learned that, um, that bald eagles were using uh, these areas to perch. And so as, as part of our, our permit compliance, uh, we agreed that we would um, not cut down the largest trees and the most desirable areas for the bald eagles. And so that's, that's why we have these two remaining tufts of trees. We do have, um, we have installed protections uh, in, those, in those areas that have that older vegetation. Uh, so, uh, so they're safe for humans and the, and the uh, biota of the area. Next slide, please. So, and then just fast forward and I'll fill in the blanks uh, in a minute, but just to fast forward, this was um, last fall, early last fall, the site's been recontoured. Uh, it's starting to green up with those hundreds of thousands of plants. Um, and you can see uh, we've cut in a water course on the right hand side, as well as a a fishing pond, um, and it's sort of difficult to get a get a feel for the change in elevation. But that that gray disc at the top there, that's somewhere around elevation 60. So you're going to have um, it's called the Summit Vista, um, and from there you'll be able to see the city of of, of Philadelphia, the Cooper River, the Delaware River. Uh, that's the highest point on the site. So we thought that that would be a, a nice area. There's benches up there. And whatnot. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a little here's a little before and after the the uh, the slide on the left there um, is after the site's been been cleared and grubbed the vegetation, but before we actually started manipulating grades. Um, the slide to the right is is after we've recontoured the grades um, and installed a clean a clean cap 
um, and, and obviously planted it with vegetation. You can see a thin uh, line of riprap there uh, in front of the living shoreline. And that is just to guard against wave energy. We do have a lot of fetch uh, in this area. Fetch is the, the distance that wind blows across the open water. And, and that does have a tendency to produce waves that can cause erosion. So we, we took the, preca the precautionary uh, measure of including riprap on these, on these leading edges. Uh, next slide, please. So here, here is, um, you know, you get a good shot of what was in the landfill, all kinds of unique debris, lots of tires, as I said before, although not seeing in, in this photo. Um, you know, this material was all, all manipulated. The habitat, the, the mature trees, that preservation area that I spoke of earlier, this is the, the northern habitat preservation area for, for the bald eagles. Uh, what we wound up doing is we wound up installing a, a wetland moat, if you will, around that area. Um, and that is really to keep separation between uh, the bald eagles and, and people. We didn't want people walking over there disturbing the eagles. And it's a nice um, sanctuary for any other wild animals that, that might want to uh, might want to use that piece uh, without having to come too close to, to, uh, to people. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, this is the, the fishing pond. Um, um, as a fisherman, I'm very excited about this. This is a pond that's flowed by the, twi flowed by the tide twice a day. Um, that, that flow will uh, open that up to the Cooper River uh, and the Delaware River. So if we do have anadromous fish that wanna get in there, uh, that would be available to them on the top half of the tide. Um, we're very anxious to see what what uses the fishing plaza. Um, it was constructed with, with recreational fishing in mind. We've got structures in the pond and you can see on the left-hand side while it's under construction, we've got sort of these, um, these turtle basking islands which also provide habitat for fish. We've got some submerged trees uh, that you really can't see here, but there's some submerged trees. There's catfish nesting boxes in there. And really we, we wanted to make this, um, you know, a, a place for people to fish and come in close contact with natural resources. We've um, long had the viewpoint that uh, the best way to protect natural resources is to get people in contact with them, have them use and enjoy the natural resources. You know, that's, um, that's key in the NRD program. That's what we're trying to, uh, to restore. Um, Thank you. Next slide. Um, so what, just uh, as, as an aside, this is also the fishing plaza and we've got a picture of a cormorant. I think there's a duck on this basking island. We have seen turtles in, in this area since. And uh, what, we, what we find with all of our projects is whenever you do a restoration, the biota are in there early, uh, you know, pretty much like the, the diesels are still idling in the background and the wildlife are flying in. So it, that's always uh, great and rewarding to see. Next slide, please. Um, you know, we've got a lot, we really focused on habitat, but again, public access and, uh, and use and enjoyment is also a piece here. And we, we couldn't have a park without uh, some picnic tables. So this is um, earlier in the construction um, and you can see the picnic tables in the foreground. If you look in the back, we're actually hydro seeding uh, some of the grassed areas. We've got solar powered lights on those light poles. So we are really, um, we're really hopeful that, that this is gonna be a place that, that people from all over um, will, will reconnect with the environment. Um, and as Frank said, you know, the, the community was, was largely cut off from these natural resources and Projects like this are going to are going to open that access back up. Next slide, please. So in the foreground, in the background, we've got the Croc Center. In the foreground, we've got a <clears throat> what we call the Northern Tidal Wetland. Um, you know, and and this this has just seen remarkable growth. Uh, very very successful. Um, great great place for, for biota. And you've got a walking trail that goes along the Croc fence sort of in the middle of the shot there. 
so people can come down uh, in this area. And and the uh, the plan is for that trail to uh, to connect up with with other trails that are that are being conceived right now. Um, next slide, please. So this is. Um, this is the pedestrian bridge that goes across what we call the, the kayak channel. Um, and if you look in the middle of the screen on the left hand side, there's there's some steps there. That's actually a kayak launch. So people, people with kayaks or organizations with kayaks can actually come to the site um, and they'll be able to launch their kayaks and excuse me. Whoever fails, right? Um, Sorry about that. So, uh, so this will be a place where, where people can launch kayaks, access the Cooper River at the end of the kayak channel, and then it's a very short paddle uh, to the back channel of the Delaware and the main stem, should you choose to go there. Um, and then what's not in the picture to, to, the, to the back of this picture is, is that tidally flowed pond. So we've got this open water kayak channel on the fringe of that open water. Uh, we've got a, a fairly robust and wide uh, tidal uh, freshwater wetland, um, and you know you, you don't you don't see tidal freshwater wetlands too often. That is a really unique uh, and resource that's that's special to to this part of New Jersey. It's a, it's an uncommon habitat, and uh, we're we're very fortunate that that we were able to, to do this restoration in this unique area. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's that's the short version. Um, maybe a bunch of you can can go out there when when the uh, project opens up, which will be uh, later this year, this fall. We we uh, we are fingers crossed, hoping that that this project will be open to the public. And uh, if you're if you're interested, um, I'm sure that there'll be opportunities. Um, you know, we can uh, give tours or, or whatnot, but. Um, you know, we're, we're in the final stages of, of finishing things up, fixing some erosion, and uh, it, it should be good in the fall. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Frank and Dave, for giving, sharing some of those updates about, you know, some of those Camden restoration projects. Uh, so the next city that we'll be hearing from is Philadelphia. Um, we're going to be getting some updates from Chris Doherty and Karen Thompson with the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation to share some updates on South Wetlands Park and Graffiti Pier Park. And Chris and Karen, I think you should be able to share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Are we good? Looks good. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Doherty. Uh, I'm a project manager here at the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation. Um, we manage the thoughtful uh, design of our central Delaware waterfront in Philadelphia, a, a six mile swath. Um, but here today, we're going to talk about a, a site that's somewhat on the periphery of our, um, our sort of area of operation on the south. This incidentally is exactly across from Phoenix Park in Camden. Uh, our site. So some interesting opportunities to think about both sides of the river there. Um, our site uh, is, is one that is constrained in some ways, uh, but we see this as an opportunity. Most of our, our site is uh, water, although we do have um, in possession the, the pier structures that you see, pier 64, 67, uh, 68, 70. Um, so that's a little bit off, but uh, there's four piers there that you can see. Um, and before that, of course, there, there was uh, an expansive network of, of tidal marshes and meadows. This was known as Wicico Meadows, and uh, our landscape architect, Nolan, was kind enough to get so granular in their analysis of the map to find these interesting landscape features and finding in that it was a lot of mudflat and that, that um, aligns with some of the other research that we've been doing. But by the 20th century, the, the sort of machine city had, had prevailed, and uh, you can you can really, it's palpable the, the, the disconnection that one would feel um, in the neighborhood kind of trying to get through this, this dense network of, of factories and, and structures. But this was the landscape in the roughly 1920s. Um, this is our site eff effectively today. You'll note that um, there's quite a bit of surface parking and uh, a structure, a big box structure 
that was some um, uh, some some development that was spurred in the 90s that um, we're, we're sort of having to deal with as a, as an interesting adjacency um, to, to our project. So the the peers that I mentioned are kind of going through um, a, their own kind of ecological resurgence, which is fascinating. Um, as they kind of decay into the, the, the water here, we're finding that um, they create great in water and, and aquatic habitat um, and, and, and some upland habitat too, where, where possible. Here you see some of the structures are already starting to fail, but we, as you'll see later, we considered that an opportunity. Uh, some really unprecedented views of the Delaware River uh, through some of these uh, some of these piers. This is 67. <clears throat> this is actually an existing um, pier 68 that DRWC made substantial investments in in 2012. Um, and this will be uh, linked to and, and sort of unified with the, the larger vision, as we'll see in a second. And this is a, a view from Pier 70, the, um, really the most downstream of the four piers. <clears throat> Inside 70 is a pretty interesting uh, allay of trees and um, we, we're trying to retain some of these landscape features. Here you get a sense of some of the, the density. Uh, just to touch a little bit on our public process, this seems so long ago, but um, we did do a series of in-person um, meetings. We had some early uh, focus groups with, with neighborhood leaders to try and um, try and get to tap into their networks uh, and, and alert them to this opportunity. Uh, South Philadelphia is seeing a huge influx of, of Latin and Southeast Asian populations. Uh, so we're conscious of that and some of our um, some of our consultants were actually translation services that uh, you'll see actually paid some dividends when we had to uh, translate into the digital realm post pandemic. Um, we also did a bio blitz and identified about 84 different species that the, the uh, iNaturalist page is still up if, if anyone wants to add to it. Um, but one of the things that, that was confirmed by our community engagement was really this, this demand that it retain its, its kind of natural uh, element as, as it's emerging. Uh, and also, I think there was an emphasis on sort of a solitary experience. Um, you'll see our design, I, I think, retains that as well. Uh, the public definitely wanted public access, but close behind, I think, is an understanding of the ecological function of the park. Um, and then I think uh, perhaps more of interest to the project managers than, than the public, the, the questions of resiliency are nonetheless uh, ones that we want to take on. And you'll also see the education. Uh, I think there's a recognition that this is a, a, a brand new landscape in some ways. Uh, and so it will need some uh, elucidation. And so we're excited about some of the opportunities for environmental education associated with, with the, the effort. And then just a smattering of, of comments here, you'll see um, there's obviously some, some interest in an expanded habitat, uh, some kayak access, and uh, I won't mention the cats, we won't get into that, but we have some competing, competing habitat there. Um, but you'll see that there's a, there's a general interest in, in uh, one area that we did think that there was a latent demand uh, was in water access. And so uh, you'll see in some of our first phases, we do have access built into uh, those. And of course, uh, as, as water access is expanding throughout the, the entire estuary, um, you know, I think there actually is a, a launch across the way at Phoenix Park. And, I'm excited to hear about some of the other launches that, that were just mentioned. So we're thinking about integrating into that network of, of really, really making uh, the urban Delaware accessible to anyone with watercraft, non-motorized, of course. Just a smattering of things that we found in our uh, bio blitz, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, we had some mycologists out there, they can identify that. Um, and also some raptors, uh, I took that picture. So. Uh, here you'll see the historic um, waterline conditions and that large expanse of intertidal space. You'll effectively see how we'll have to compress that uh, wide, wide transect into our, our landform, which is pretty, pretty uh, compact. It's also, it's obviously also a site that floods um, consistently. And so whatever we do put in uh, the floodway, we're going to have to be conscious of that. Um, and conscious of its hydraulic forces around it. And we've done some modeling of uh, 
what climate change and sea level rise in, in Delaware, in the Delaware Bay and, and river will do for our particular site. And um, even, uh, even today, we see some uh, inundation of some of the structures at, at high tide. Um, and by 2080, the high tide will, will inundate some structures here, certainly 70 and 67. So we, we need to be conscious of that in, in, in terms of our planning for this to be a long-term um, positive investment. And then you'll see that um, the 100, 100 year storm of today or the 500 year storm of today is, uh, is the 100 equivalent to the 100 year storm in 2080. Uh, there's a question about the, the climate crisis, I think in the, in the chapter, but I, in the chat function, but I think this uh, summarizes the crisis. Our particular site uh, has, a, has a whole host of different uh, legacy construction associated with it, with its industrial use. And so uh, we're having to um, navigate the world of these different structures and systems. And oftentimes thinking about what are, what are ways that we can do this, dissipate energy for plantings in a way that, that is designed with nature. And I think there was also across the way um, at the Canvin Municipal uh, uh, Utilities site, there is some thought of a living shoreline and we're very much interested in, in parallel projects like that. Just, the, uh, just a brief uh, survey of the upland conditions. Um, 67 is, is fairly difficult uh, being all concrete, but 60, um, 67 has some, 64 has some, um, and, and 70 as well. The overall strategy for um, the wetland planning is to take um, very low quality uh, freshwater um, tidal wetlands and, and diversify them. Uh, and expands the, the ecological functionality of them um, with some emergent freshwater uh, plantings and other uh, in-water plantings as well, we hope. Uh, some of our uh, regulators asked us to do an assessment of uh, the, the existing mudflats that are out there and, and inventoried. Um, we found them unfortunately to be fairly depleted uh, by anthropogenic uh, influences. But here you'll see that one of our ecologists was able to identify a, an alewife floater mussel kind of existing in a hollow uh, near Pier 68 uh, that had the optimal kind of channel conditions for, for these. So there is certainly uh, some promise if, if, um, if, if we just sort of boost the, boost the ecology in the right way. Here you'll see uh, trying to compress that, that transect into uh, a fairly tight space and also manage the degree of filling that we're doing in, into this existing uh, identified, um, albeit poorly performing uh, mud flat. So going back to some of the kind of original uh, design intention here, uh, public access, um, a, an, an ec ecology that is thriving and one that is transparent um, and, and also uh, educable. And then doing it within an elegant framework, I think, is important for us. Some of the secondary um, um, elements of our program, um, or I think, you know, as we mentioned, some of the access. Uh, fishing is a huge uh, use of this, of this space, of Pier 68, so we want to be conscious and mindful of that community in our planning. Um, additionally, we, we also are thinking first phase about a structure that potentially could serve a, a variety of uses, maybe perhaps a boathouse. Um, uh, certainly a comfort station is something that will be needed along this stretch. Um, this is also at the, at the far end of uh, our Delaware River Trail, so it will function also um, as, a, uh, as a trail. So here you see the, the fundamental features of, of what we're intending for the South Philadelphia Wetlands Park. Um, at the very top, you'll see the, the boardwalk structure doubles as a kind of um, wave attenuator and energy dissipation structure, uh, but that will link Pier 70 with Pier 68 and across to 67. Um, you'll also notice that we went with the degradation of the pier structure and created a breach uh, that we hope um, we'll introduce some of that tidal flow that, that, um, that the, our folks in New Jersey have been so successful. Um, at, at, the, at the far north end of the site, you'll see that, there, again, the, the natural edge is, is something we want to emphasize here and, and sort of urge people to connect with. And so 
uh, portions of the adventure path are only accessible via um, low tide conditions. There's basically two tiers of circulation, uh, sort of a, a, above, kind of on the water, uh, like I said, from 70 across to 68, um, and then across a, another uh, elevated bridge and boardwalk structure. And as I said, the, the lower loop, the adventure loop, is a little bit more off, off trail. And here you'll see what we're intending uh, as far as wave, wave attenuation and, and uh, humongous hydraulic forces moving through here. As you can see, the navigation channel is, is very, very close, um, and that's a 50-foot depth. So uh, some real energy moving through here that we're going to have to be conscious of. We're also planning for sort of migration of, of, of the marsh. And so anticipating the conditions in 2080 as we, as we identified, uh, where does the marsh go? And so we've built in some gradients to allow uh, movement up, up, upland. So here you'll see um, hopefully a certain degree of longevity and responsiveness to our built environment here. Um, this, is, this is current conditions if we build. And then this is a high tide condition uh, in 2080, still, uh, still accessible. This is then again. You see the the benefit of the boardwalk structure um, from 2080 on out. These are just some cross sectional views of um, the kayak channel. This is looking from Pier 70 across to existing uh, Pier 68, which will have an expanded um, uh, fishing area. And then this is at, at 64, looking downriver. That great view. And then this is another view from 64. This is from the, the kayak channel. Um, this ours is speculative, um, but glad to see it's it's been done uh, over in the over in the Camden side, and we're excited to to try and bring that that same kind of feature to Philadelphia. One of the things that I mentioned in our community engagement that we had to pivot to, obviously, an online presence. Um, we, we thought that a 3D model uh, would be an excellent way for the public to really explore this space. And we built one and uh, happy to say that we got 1400 uh, unique kind of visits and manipulations of the model. Uh, we additionally, as I mentioned, some of the demographic um, uh, developments in South Philadelphia, we translated uh, into Spanish, Cambodian, Vietnamese and Chinese. And um, that is the model features. And we were glad to see that people avail themselves of that feature as well. Just quickly talking about phasing, it's a considerable uh, effort. Uh, so our phase one, uh, you'll see on the far right side is, is, a, is hopefully a more manageable about 5 million. And it uh, is essentially our proof of concept that we can uh, create a, a, an energy barrier and then a planted space inside of that, but also add the access that, that I think the public This is where we're at currently in, in design. We, um, I think we're, we're fairly through conceptual and have a concept. Uh, we've had some preliminary conversations with our regulators, but looking to continue those conversations um, and then uh, carry forward some of our architectural components um, and maybe some environmental graphics, as I mentioned, to making the landscape legible uh, and the ecology legible. And then we will need some additional funding to take this into uh, construction documents. And if anyone has any uh, interest in, in following some of the 3D model, uh, please head over to DelawareRiverWaterfront.org, South Wetlands Park. You can check out the model and all sorts of other project information there. So um, glad to be able to share with everybody. And uh, I think now my, my colleague, Director of Planning, Karen Thompson, is going to talk about uh, the graffiti pier. Thanks, Chris. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Share my screen. All right, so um, hi, thanks everyone um, for being here today. Um, as Chris said, um, I'm Karen Thompson. I'm the Director of Planning with DRWC, and I'm gonna talk about um, another project we have in design um, on the kind of opposite end of our planning area from the South Wetlands Park up in the river wards of Philadelphia um, is called Graffiti Pier. Um, it's technically known as Pier 18 North, um, and the project really encompasses Pier 18, Pier 20 adjacent to it, and some of the upland south. 
Um, but I think you'll note here um, in comparison to the South Wetlands Park, um, DRWC is building out this network of parks. And obviously we have similar approaches in terms of ecological uplift um, and wetlands, um, but you'll see a park with a, a very, very different uh, character and approach here. Um, so this is just a site overview um, for anyone who's not familiar with it. Um, this is Graffiti Pier right here. You can see that my cursor. Um, and it's adjacent to the Port Richmond and Old Richmond neighborhoods in Philadelphia. It's just north of Fishtown. Um, it's directly across from Petty's Island as well. And this is, um, we're planning for six acres um, within a much larger area that's currently owned by Conrail. Um, the sort of north half of their site um, is active industrial, um, and the southern half is inactive um, with unknown plans right now, but we have entered into a memorandum of understanding with Conrail um, to begin a process by which we can acquire Graffiti Pier, Pier 20, and some of the uplands. Um, and as part of that MOU, they allowed us, before we owned the, the park, um, to go ahead and start that conceptual planning process. Um, so these are just a couple photos of present day. This is looking at Graffiti Pier from um, the pier uh, directly sort of northeast of it. Um, it. Graffiti Pier itself, this is a former um, McMiler coal dumper, um, wherein coal would come in from the Lehigh Valley um, and be put onto the ships through this structure um, and then taken out to the rest of uh, the world. Um, and this is inside of that structure, um, it's become Hence its name, it's become a very well-known place for graffiti writers. Um, but it's this really incredible industrial remnant. Um, and you can see in the photo on the right that nature has also taken over again. Um, and so it's this wonderful juxtaposition of industry and of river ecology and nature um, that's uh, really quite unique. Uh, so just zooming in a little bit, as I said, we were, um, this larger red outline here is um, kind of area that we could consider as part of the context of our planning study, but that we were specifically looking at Pier 18 um, and Pier 20 and then some of the uplands area. And this um, site, site plan here also shows um, immediately to the south is a uh, new development that's currently under construction that's bringing about 1,100 units um, and new residents um, very close to the site, which sort of figures into the design team's approach um, for how they looked at, at how to design this site. So a little more history here. You can see here in the photo on the left, um, kind of roughly identifying where Graffiti Pier was located um, in relation to um, the four groups of the, the Turtle Clan, the four villages um, of the Leni Lenape. Um, on the upper right, the, you can see that's an 1808 map uh, showing the marshland, um, as Chris mentioned, similar to, to the southern waterfront. The Delaware River was a lot of marshland, um, and that's just putting the site in that context. Um, but then by 1872, again, uh, the story we see all over the river, um, industry had come to the site. And in this case, it was a massive rail yard as part of the Reading Railroad. Um, and Pier 20 itself was actually part of the Cramp Shipyard, which was located um, immediately next to this site. Um, and here, just a little more history, um, you can see that cramped shipyard in that upper left photo and the Port Richmond Terminal. Um, graffiti Pier, you can see it there with its flood, Pier 18 with the, the full McMiler coal structure. Um, and the, the image on the right is a, just a map showing the extent of cramped shipyard. Um, so again, just uh, this was an incredibly active industrial site. Um, and, and much like the other areas of the waterfront, it's, it's all of this industry and then eventually the construction of I-95 that cut off all of these adjacent neighborhoods um, from their river. And even though industry has left, they are still very cut off from this river. Um, so another aspect of history um, that our design team uh, did some research in was the history of graffiti. Um, so as I said, this, this site had been um, starting in about the mid 1980s. Um, it had been abandoned by the Reading Railroad, um, absorbed by Conrail, um, but then graffiti artists started using the structure um, to practice their art. It's a place for practice. It's not a place for big artists to put up pieces, um, but it was sort of interesting here, um, noting that Philadelphia was actually the birthplace of graffiti. Um, and obviously that plays a really important role on the site. So that was key to our analysis as well. Um, so in a couple other bits of the analysis that really figured into how the design team approached the site, 
um, was, as I mentioned, these neighborhoods have been historically cut off from the river. Um, and you know, when we did this mapping of uh, available recreation, the, the adjacent neighborhoods are actually fairly well served by active recreation. They're served by ball fields, by rec centers, by playgrounds. But what they do not have a lot of is green public space. They don't have a space where they can just sit and be in nature. And that was something we heard a lot from the nearby neighbors. Um, whether they were interested in graffiti or not, Graffiti Pier was a place where they go um, to get away from the dense neighborhoods when it's hot in the summer. Um, graffiti Pier is a wonderfully peaceful, beautiful, shady space for them to be. Um, and then another obviously key part of this analysis was um, demonstrating the effects of the climate crisis on Graffiti Pier itself. Um, we know that uh, sea level rise, we're going to see a 2.3 foot increase uh, by 2050. Um, we're going to see increased salinity that will affect ecology. We'll see an increase in the tidal ranges. Um, and all of these impacts are going to continue to put more pressure on the site itself and actually start to potentially make the site um, inaccessible. So, with their engagement, uh, with their analysis, we also um, did an extensive amount of community engagement. Um, this space, because of both its, um, its use by the adjacent neighborhoods for nature and as well as the many, many graffiti artists and people interested in graffiti art um, using the site since the 80s, um, this site um, probably in some senses more than any of our other ones had an existing very large, very passionate constituency. And we wanted to make sure that we were listening to them, uh, that we reached everyone and really heard what, what the space meant to them and, and how um, they wanted to see it reused. Um, so one of the key parts of this engagement was a really simple question, uh, which is just asking people what was the best thing that could happen at Graffiti Pier and what was the worst thing that could happen at Graffiti Pier. Um, and we asked people in in-person public meetings, we had places, uh, we had books and these um, canvases where people could write them if they didn't want to speak. Um, and we also held sort of separate gatherings with current street artists um, who tend to want to be anonymous, who tend, you know, public meetings aren't their thing, um, to engage them as well and hear from them directly. And we asked everyone that same question, what is the best thing and what is the worst thing? So the design team sort of mapped all of that onto this quadrant um, of best thing to worst thing and untouched new park. Um, and overwhelmingly, um, the desire for Graffiti Pier was, you can see in that upper left, keep it a hidden gem. Um, it's a space where um, it's not technically publicly accessible, but people do go there. Um, and it is, you feel like you found it for the first time every time you go there. It's an incredibly special sense of discovery. Um, and so that along with the ability to make art um, was key for everyone. And in the lower right, you'll see um, people, their biggest concerns were condos coming in, the site being demolished and all of that, you know, decades of history and of culture being erased. So all of that came together, all of this analysis, the impacts of climate change, um, the impending development um, and the fear of the community that they might lose the site for the, and help the design team create this sort of buffer strategy that drove their concept. I um, mean, you can see some of their diagrams here um, with pressures from development coming on all sides. Um, pier 20 itself is degrading, um, causing additional pressure on graffiti pier. Um, so they took this, this approach um, to, uh, oops, sorry. Um, to buffer graffiti pier itself and use um, wetlands and other types of um, strategies like that to manage stormwater, to manage sea level rise, um, and hopefully protect graffiti pier in the future. Um, because as much as we heard, the site shouldn't change, the site should stay the way it is. Um, the site needs to adapt if it's going to remain the way it is. Um, it can't just be left alone. So that sort of informed the design team's um, strategy. Um, and that got us to our conceptual framework, which is a publicly accessible place that feels found. Um, it's a place where we can ensure the continuation and expansion of art. Um, we can keep the site vegetative and passive. Um, make it safe and accessible without looking safe and accessible and keeping it gritty. Um, it's, it's very cool as it is and the design team and what we heard from the public was let's not mess with that. So that was uh, drove their approach. 
So this is the, um, the concept plan that we've developed. You'll see that on the left, the full plan. Um, and really it's divided into three sort of character zones, um, the upland forest, the shoreline buffer, and then graffiti pier itself. And zooming in a bit, the upland forest, um, this is where you enter the site. Um, there is existing paths. And so um, the thinking of this is just upgrading those paths very simply so that they are actually accessible to all users. Um, keeping that sense of discovery that you get as you enter in the site, but removing invasive plants and bringing in um, plants that are uh, better suited to this environment. Um, and then you'll also see here these red boxes. Those are places um, where they were sort of inspired by the dual history of the site as both um, a freight rail yard and with the history of graffiti, um, the proposal to bring in old train cars to act as um, additional opportunities for walls to create art. And this is a rendering of, of the entrance. And I think what you'll see here through all these renderings is this very light touch approach the designers have taken. Um, you know, in the, in the bottom half of your screen, you can see an existing um, photo of that entrance again, very heavily vegetated. It just gets more vegetated as you walk in. So replacing that, um, the invasives with natives, um, upgrading that path slightly, but really keeping that same character as you go into the site. Um, and then this is a, a rendering of what a potential train car um, could look like within the, the environment as a place to continue to create art. Um, and the shoreline buffer zone, um, this is both Pier 20, which as I mentioned, is currently already degrading. Um, we're not looking to rebuild it, but we're looking to work with it um, and use um, what it is to help buffer um, graffiti pier. So you can see here, there's um, the central, central wetlands and then a wetlands on the other side of Graffiti Pier. Um, and this is about creating a resilient edge um, using constructed tidal marshes that would filter and absorb stormwater um, rather than using bulkhead walls here. Um, and then Pier 20 itself is transformed from the dilapidated pier that it is into um, a functional landscape. Um, with a reinforced living shoreline edge, um, and then a new seawall out at the end um, for additional tidal marsh species, um, but that also functions as an expanded surface for art creation as well. And you'll see here a rendering of that, of those seawalls um, that potentially some artists um, might be able to use and, and have it serve both functions. And then Graffiti Pier itself, um, which is really what brings people to the site um, if it's not nature, um, this is really um, staying as is, um, making the repairs that are needed um, to make the site safe, um, but letting it continue to be a place where people can come and practice their art um, without concern um, of being kicked out. This will continue to be a place for that and additional kinds of art. We may be able to add uh, more curated events, sculpture, um, but this is a place for art. Um, and then this would also include things like seating, lighting, um, so that it's, again, it goes back to that, that from the concept of being safe and accessible without feeling too safe and accessible. So these are a few renderings. Again, I think this explains the sort of light touch approach we've taken um, and adding a, a railing here, which is actually um, based on the original designs of the railings from that we found at the Reading Archive. Um, so with the goal that that railing, railing feels like it's been there for the last hundred years and isn't a new, uh, a new thing. Um, and this is a space, it's called the platform. This is about the middle of the pier. There, this is where the structure was that took the coal and put it onto ships. Um, and that's been removed. Um, but this is a place where we can add seating. It can also serve as a performance venue um, for art installations, any number of options like that. And then um, what we call the rooms, this is sort of in the middle of the, the graffiti pier itself. You can walk through the structure all the way out to the end. Um, and again, this is just upgraded paths to make them um, ADA accessible, um, improved plantings, but really uh, maintaining its character. And then um, what would be really special for, for this, uh, for graffiti pier is the second level, the second level where the coal went on the rails um, is technically not accessible now, but we're looking at being able to add um, a ramp to allow public access to this level um, to take advantage of the incredible views back to the city and up and down the Delaware River. Um, so that's the, the overall concept plan. Um, we'd love to do it all in one go, um, but even with that light touch approach, 
uh, building those wetlands, doing the repairs that we need to make to Graffiti Pier itself. Um, we know that we're probably going to be taking a phased approach to this as well. Um, so this is showing um, kind of our, our preferred phasing approach. Um, as I said, we're, we're working on acquiring this property from Conrail. We don't have it yet. Um, so phase zero may just be us acquiring the land and making it secure. Um, hopefully we won't have to do that for very long and we'll be able to secure funding to move uh, directly into phase one, which we call early access and activation. Um, and that's really focused on um, the entrance to, um, to the area. Um, upgrading a path that gets you out to Graffiti Pier, making the repairs to Graffiti Pier, adding the railing, and otherwise stepping back. Um, phase two would be um, some additional work on Graffiti Pier, um, working on a trail connection that would connect um, to the Delaware River Trail, um, creation of the central wetlands next to Pier 20, and um, expanding the work done in the upland buffer zone. Um, and the final phase for phase three would be um, completion of Pier 20, the Eastern Wetlands, um, the Graffiti Pier second level, um, and then all of the additional planting, lighting, and furnishing. So that's where we are now. We are, um, like I said, we've just recently wrapped up this conceptual design and we're now working on um, pursuing funding for phase one um, and hopefully can uh, get that moving soon. Thank you. Okay, great. What a cool project. Uh, so thank you very much, Christopher and Karen. Uh, we have a few more speakers from Philadelphia. Um, we're going to turn it over to Stephanie Branch with EPA Region 3, who will be giving some updates for, for the uh, Philadelphia Authority for Industrial Development. So Stephanie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a Brownfields project manager for several grants in the mid-Atlantic states and of course here in Philadelphia. Show a quick film uh, highlighting, I'm, I'm actually filling in for the Philadelphia Authority for Industrial Development who manages a, a bunch of grants for us. And they, um, it's a, just so you're not confused, the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, PIDC actually does all the work. So here's a quick video, and then I'll go into a quick update of what they're working on. Uh, let me know if you can see it. Here it comes, transforming the lower Schuylkill. Hold on. The area that's the lower Schuylkill is about 3,700 acres of land. That's roughly 20% of all industrial land in the city. But it was one of the older, most intensively used industrial districts in Philadelphia. And for a long time, it was part of what made Philadelphia Workshop of the World. The garden was largely surrounded by farmland when the Bartrams first established this place. But the Southwest soon became the industrial hub of our city. And it also became a place where a lot of transportation routes came through. So as a result, I think the garden became very disconnected from the lives of people, particularly at the time when industry was booming. The Forgotten Bottom was an industrial neighborhood. Workers that worked in, in factories and uh, manufacturing plants that were right here in the neighborhood. Well, those factories over time closed or moved on and the neighborhood did fall on hard times, particularly as the rest of the city fell on some hard times in the 70s and 80s uh, and into the 90s. So we were fortunate to have a couple of publicly owned sites north and south of Bartram's Garden. That's within an area in the Lower School Master Plan that we called the Innovation District. It was vacant, highly polluted, and we owned it, lucky us. <laughs> we had important partners early on that helped us propel the vision. One of those was the US EPA with their Brownfields cleanup grants we were able to take that and add DEP and state grant dollars and the city of Philadelphia resources and do cost-effective cleanup for these properties. For us, it was about getting the sites ready to attract investment and development to this area. It's not every day that adjacent to your campus, 23 acres becomes available. And so we decided to purchase the site we're one of the first to kind of take off uh, and actually develop a site within the innovation district. Everything 
everyone here feels very connected to the streets they live on. And change can be difficult, particularly with respect to large development or large remediation projects. But they also understand how much better off they'll be as a community if that land is used for something more creative, more natural, or even used for commercial purposes. Working with the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, we were able to apply for the EPA Revolving Fund Grant, and that kept us on budget, and so it's been a great partnership. On the third floor, we have the Penn Engineering Research Collaboration Hub. On this floor, what goes on is indistinguishable, really, from the same basic research that you would see anywhere on campus, except we have a lot more of it. We have better facilities. The magic for us is that we're uh, cheek and gel with many, many, many different corporate uh, collaborators as well. So there's no question that we have a greater diversity of conversations now in this environment than we could have had on the campus. It gives us a much, much greater opportunity to understand what the companies are thinking about and gives them much greater access to us. We've been spinning off quite a number of companies, including our own students who are spinning off these small companies. What we've been able to do is to provide cost-effective lab space so that a young idea can begin growth at an affordable space. That has resulted in other graduate students, postgraduate students, finding a home in the Penovation Center. Our goal is that companies graduate from this center, move into one of the adjacent buildings for their next stage of development, and then after that, they maybe build a building of their own. My students are very excited about uh, bioinspiration and um, legged mobility and what we can learn from the animals. We love our neighbors in the Working Dog Center. We're particularly envious of those working dogs. They're so much better than anything we can build right now. That's just a, a great, inspiring neighborhood to have. When I first saw the site, I knew right away that this was going to be a great place to have our program because what we're allowed to do here is let the dogs learn about environmental challenges that they might encounter in the real world. So whether they're search and rescue dogs, or police dogs, our dogs have to work in urban environments. They have to be accustomed to the noise, to the sirens, to the smells. We have dogs in medical detection. We have arson detection dogs. We have some dogs that are doing bed bug detection. We are also so closely located to Penn's campus, to Drexel's campus. It really creates an incredible community. And we have all of the collaboration for research. So we have so much opportunity because of our location here. We couldn't be happier. The workforce that's going to be, we think, attracted to places like this is in demand throughout the world. And as a result, they can be pretty particular about the places they're going to work. So from a pure employment attraction perspective, businesses need to have a good setting. So part of our goal would be not just to have this beautiful riverfront trail and state-of-the-art research and development and production facilities, but also to have a place that welcomes the people in the community, both near and far. In this neighborhood, we strongly feel that what people see when they first enter your neighborhood really can set the impression for it wants to come. Now that we see how that little campus has been tied into the trail, now that we see what a difference that makes as a gateway to our community, everyone's pretty excited. And we're grateful for the investment in the community, and we look forward to some more, actually. The Lower Schuylkill Master Plan has a great deal of very exciting opportunities to reconnect this community back to this garden and the surrounds as a place for local jobs and incredible public amenities. This kind of public infrastructure is really meaningful in a place that has been disconnected for so long. I grew up here in Barton's Village with Barton's Garden as my backyard. As a kid, it was more like just a lonely place. You didn't really see many people back here. But if you come now, it's really nice to see that they're putting effort into making something that's really like nice for the community to have. <clears throat>
it's a beautiful thing to watch people from like different communities and cultures and stuff come together as one. The Innovation District feels a little bit disconnected, but it's really not. It's a 17 minute ride from City Hall to roughly where I'm standing right now. It's a three minute ride on a trolley. So the University of Sciences of Philadelphia's campus, and it's about an eight or nine minute ride to the heart of University of Pennsylvania. So it's accessible, it's right along the Schuylkill River Trail, the most popular urban trail in the United States. We have the river right at our back here. We are minutes from some of the most prestigious research institutions in University City and the University of Pennsylvania's commercialization technology research campus. So that collection of assets really are unparalleled anywhere else in the United States. It's hard to beat. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to, if I can get this off my screen, um, quick quick PowerPoint and get you guys on your way. Um, so here is a quick slide, uh, PowerPoint on like an update of what's happening with our grant with PAID or PIDC in the city of Philadelphia. Okay, so EPA, as you heard, has been a very critical partner to PIDC in the city of Philadelphia and its efforts to transform the vacant, contaminated and blighted industrial lower Sukkul River into a place that can attract and support investment and development in the cell and gene therapy sectors. Much like angel investment early in a startup company, EPA's plans played the same critical role at the very onset of the PIDC's project development efforts. So we, um, we have, as you know, assessment grants, cleanup grants, and revolving loan funds. So these are four, wait, one, two, three, four, five of the assessments that have, uh, that's the beginning of the projects. We go out, figure out if it's contaminated, how much contamination, and then come up with a remedial plan or a plan for redevelopment. <clears throat> so here are the cleanups that have been completed. The uh, ones on 49th, 58th. You saw one in the video it was like a big tower. If you see it now, it's grass, but I think they're planning to put a biofuel um, like a depot for the buses and transportation systems for Penn there. Um, cleanups. So we have the Pinnovation Center, that was an old uh, DuPont facility. Um, we funded. Uh, about 45 acres of vacant industrial land for productive use in these cleanups. So this is the site you saw in the video, Greenwood Charter School, um, the other lab, and then Impact Services, which is in a different neighborhood up in Kingsington. And it's an area where they've, uh, they've built uh, homes for homeless veterans. Very busy group. Um, and then our revolving loan funds, what's going on here? Well. I don't know what to do. But anyway, so the revolving loan fund program has, we've given them about 1.9 million and um, they've cleaned up four sites and leveraged more than $38 million to D. It's been a really good uh, partner. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen. So I'm still here. If you guys have any questions, comments, I'll be here until the end of the call. That pretty much concludes the update for PAID. I hope I didn't take too much time. No, you're great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, next, uh, we'll hear some updates from James Brown, uh, Housing Development Officer with the Philadelphia Housing Development Corporation. And James, I'm going to go ahead and pull up your slides for you in just a minute. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is James L. Brown. I work for the Philadelphia Housing Development Corporation. And as Emily said, I'm a housing development officer there. My um, primary purpose is to finance the development of affordable housing. Um, I joined PHCC uh, in January of 2020. And right after I joined, I immediately um, got put in charge of using our Brownfield assessment funds to start taking a look at different properties around the city to uh, 
to make assessments on whether or not they were environmentally safe or if they had any issues um, or we had any recognized environmental conditions out there that would inhibit further housing development. So I kind of got, I kind of just jumped into the fire <laughs> uh, right when I got there. And one of the issues we found in some of the communities where we were doing housing development was that there was a big, uh, a big concern about food. And we decided to partner up with uh, the Neighborhood Gardens Trust, which is an offshoot of the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. And we were able to find out um, a lot of additional information about community gardens and how they were actually really, really important to the daily survival of residents in communities um, where they didn't always have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And so I, at the time, I really didn't know how important this was and how it was interconnected to housing development. So this was, I would say, pre-pandemic working with Neighborhood Gardens Trust. But, you know, two months later, we started, we were into the pandemic itself. Um, and some of these issues were really, really highlighted. So you can move to the next slide, Emily. Um, we reached out to 22 garden sites. That's where we actually completed uh, phase one assessments with our EPA assessment grant. And we were able to determine uh, that many of them didn't have any issues, but we were also able to make some recommendations on um, where community gardens could make some improvements so that the soil uh, would be appropriately used and that there wouldn't be any other recognized environmental conditions that perhaps could get into, uh, you know, the, the food or vegetable uh, growing um, and trying to help educate and make our neighbors and citizens or residents concerned um, and make them more aware of, uh, of using, of us using brownfield funds for assessment, but make them more aware of how the environment impacts their daily lives, including but not limited to their food. We also performed um, some soil testing at around 11 sites and we had some information and data that came back from them. We were able to give it to the Neighborhood Gardens Trust and we hope that we'll be able to apply for another a round of funding soon uh, to help mitigate some of the issues that they did find. None of them life-threatening, thank goodness, but nonetheless, uh, we did find some issues that have to be remediated and, and taken care of. Um, we completed this coordination primarily with the Philadelphia Horticultural Society, the Philadelphia Water Department, uh, Philadelphia Parks and Recreation, as well as the Neighborhood Gardens Trust. And that was our, our 2015 grant. So you can move forward, Emily. Um, similar to the garden situation was also the importance of, um, of playground sites. Um, all these things that were that we were finding out were all pre-pandemic, but we've also tried to implement this philosophy with um, our RFPs that go out for development to make sure that people understand, that make sure developers understand that this is going to be an ongoing issue with brownfields located in all all areas of the city, um, especially areas that have been disinvested for the last 20 or 30 years, many of them in industrial parts of the city. Uh, where there's vacant land and there are concerns about redeveloping that land. Um, we've also partnered with people in those communities to rethink about how we use community gardens to offset some of the, the food expenses that are happening in some of these areas that are deeply impoverished. Um, many people would not really recognize how uh, how deep of an issue this really is. And thankfully, being able to use the grant, it certainly brought my attention to it. You can go, there we go. Um, one of the other issues we found were, was related to parks and playgrounds. Um, as you've seen in some of the other presentations, they've made wonderful use of EPA funds out on the river and, and applying, uh, applying these funds for the cleanup of green spaces, which is really, really fantastic. Um, it's an important part of everyone's life that lives in the city, but there are also areas within the city that don't have uh, easy or quick access to these green spaces along the Delaware River. And so we've applied some of these resources for parks and playgrounds. Um, we were able to get out to four large park and playgrounds this uh, last summer where we were able to complete uh, phase ones. And um, now we're, you know, working hand in hand with them to support designs. 
and come up with solutions for those playgrounds through the rebuild program that's been funded here in Philadelphia. So this also gives uh, kids and residents a clean uh, place to play um, and kind of heightens the importance of those playgrounds and their interconnectivity with Fairmount Park and other, other small green spaces within the inner city itself. So we're really looking forward to continuing, continuing on with that program. You can move to the next slide, Em. Thank you. The biggest, uh, the biggest issue that we're working on right now um, is in the community of Eastwick. Eastwick has sustained a tremendous amount of flooding over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, we are currently evaluating uh, some infrastructure for about 165 acres of vacant land that we think may be able to be developed. And in, uh, in the lower left-hand corner of this slide is an area that has some, some, red, some red lines around it. Uh, those are the areas that we have been thinking about potential redevelopment until we were able to actually engage using these resources from the EPA to further make assessments on where's the water flowing and what's going on with flooding in Eastwick since it's been going on for such a long period of time. Um, our consultant is, has been AKRF Environmental Consultants, and they have been coming up with a tremendous amount of information that we didn't have beforehand, uh, particularly where Darby Creek and Cobbs Creek um, meet together. Uh, near the top left-hand corner of your picture, you can kind of see where Darby Creek and Cobbs Creek intervene. They meet together, and a lot of that water flow uh, comes right on down into Eastwick. We literally got out there two days after ECAS hit. And so we were able to gather a lot of on ground data, um, pictures. We were, I was actually able to walk around and see where some of the flood flooding occurred. And as a developer, I really didn't have any idea uh, prior to this of how badly uh, this area gets, gets flooded out. So using the assessment grant to continue our study, we haven't completed our hydrologic and hydraulic study just yet, but it is definitely reframing the conversation about using development funds uh, in this particular segment of the city. And it is reorienting the conversation about whether or not we should be using funds for flood mitigation or for further real estate development uh, on land that's owned by PACC. Um, I would say this has been uh, an enlightening experience for me uh, especially working with Stephanie at the EPA um, to find out about how this, how it's so impactful. You know, you hear about agencies all the time and sometimes, you know, you, you never really get in touch with what the agency is doing. Um, but this is actually on the ground work that's going to change lives in this particular area of Eastwick. Um, we have actually actively been engaging the community with, um, with different panels um, as we've been uh, collecting the data. And we think that uh, once we have it near the end of March, well now April, maybe the end of April, we'll be able to um, communicate that information back to the community. And then we'll be able to come up with some, some development ideas that, that might make better sense or better use of funds. Um, we got out there about one week. <laughs> That's when our study was actually approved by the EPA, which was really, really fast. And um, we have been coordinating with other agencies, not just uh, not just on development, but we have but other community agencies in Eastwick. Um, we also have some targeted Phase One ESAs that we want to do to the Clear Fuel Land Fuel Superfund site um, to help support potential senior housing development on higher ground, and that's kind of where we are at the moment until we finish doing our hydraulic and hydrologic study. And then we will be able to get back to you, hopefully with some uh, with some more concrete information and maybe some new development ideas in the future. But that's where we are right now from the Philadelphia Housing Development Corporation. Um, we've also talked deeply about stewardship, um, trying to get the community involved and in and in being empowered to take its uh, you know take its own actions with uh, flood mitigation and. Um, and using different means and different methods to get that information to city agencies. And uh, that in itself has been a learning process. Um, 
helping them understand some of the science behind what we're doing and how that information can can be communicated to people in in, uh, in neighborhoods and residents. So I think overall it's going to be very empowering and I do think there will be a, a really great outcome um, once we're able to to finish our our study and hopefully we'll have a uh, have a great presentation for you in the near future or maybe in a year once we um, determine which which sites we're actually going to develop and which ones we're going to have to rethink for flood mitigation. But definitely an important part. So thank you for your time today and um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about what's going on at PHCC. Great. Uh, thank you very much for those updates, James. And um, now moving on to our last presentation today, we'll include some updates from Wilmington, Delaware on Wilmington Wetlands Park and CBR4 sediment remediation planning. And we're going to be hearing from John Cargill with the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control and Marion Young with Bright Fields. And just for a quick time check, we'll give you guys uh, 20 minutes. Does that, does that work for your presentation? Yeah, that sounds good. That is the length of it. Um, I, I am able to uh, have video here. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen or if I'm going to need you to do that. Sounds good. Can you see it? Or yep, no? we can see it, Marion. OK, let me get the slideshow here. Good now. Ready, ready to go. Can you see it? Okay. Um, it's not in presentation view. It's not in presentation. Okay, give me a second. It's on the other screen. Give me a second. Can you give me a quick tip on how to switch the screen? You're just going to want to select that other screen um, when it asks you where you want to share from. So when you push that green button, you're going to want to click the screen of yours that has the PowerPoint up already. All right. Thanks, Leah. And if we can't get it, Marion, I'm happy to share. Yeah, I would ask you to go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. No, nope, not... no worries. These things happen. Let's zoom. You never know. Are you bringing it up, Emily, or do you need me to? You got it. All right, look good. Thank you. That looks great. Oh, Thanks so much. Yep. So I'm Marion Young, the president of Brightfields, and we're an environmental consulting and remediation company in Wilmington, Delaware. And I'm here today with John Cargill, hydrologist and manager at the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Controls. Division of Watershed Stewardship. So John and I worked together on many challenging investigation and remediation projects. And we appreciate the opportunity to tell you about some of the exciting environmental restoration work that's happening in Delaware and some of the history about how these projects came to be. Switch, please, thanks. Like all old cities, Wilmington was built along the rivers. The Swedes settled along the Christina River in the 1600s. The DuPonts built their gunpowder factory along the Brandywine in the 1800s. But, and back in those days, the rivers were bordered by floodplains and broad coastal marshes teeming with fish and wildlife. But by the 1800s, like in all of your cities as well, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing and the floodplains and the marshes were filled in with debris and wastes. And then factories, rail lines, roads, businesses, and homes were built on top. But in some areas, remnants of the marsh remained, like this degraded wetland in the red circle, just to the west of the environmental justice neighborhood of South Bridge. Next slide, please. Because of its low-lying position, the citizens of South Bridge endured years of flooding. And the area is also served by combined sewer overflow systems, so floodwaters contain sewage as well as rainwater. Over the years, uh, back as far as the 50s, the city of Wilmington commissioned engineering reports to study the problem. 
Solutions were proposed, but were not built because of the huge expense and because the African-American citizens of South Bridge were marginalized and did not have a strong political voice. Time passed, flooding continued. Next slide, please. In the mid 2000s, Denrex Coastal Programs obtained funding from NOAA to develop a special area management plan or SAMP for South Wilmington. The goal was to address urban coastal management issues and neighborhood revitalization. And through meetings and focus groups with South Bridge residents and business owners, Denrex learned about the issues of not only flooding, but pollution concerns, deteriorating roads and sidewalks, dangerous intersections and other health issues. Denrex brought in experts from state agencies, the city of Wilmington, Newcastle County, uh, the Department of Transportation to listen and develop solutions. And with the publication of the South Wilmington Neighborhood Plan, Marvin Thomas, president of the Southbridge Civic Association, he said, Southbridge is small, it's compact. It's populated primarily by African-Americans. And we have not been able to get the attention financially or the support that we think we deserve over the years. We find ourselves today a little bit better off because of this plan. Next slide, please. To find a solution for the flooding, the SAMP team looked hard at a degraded marsh on the west side of Southbridge. It had been used as a dump for contaminated soil. It was covered with Phragmites and it was owned by private companies. Could this marsh be turned into green infrastructure stormwater storage? Next slide. Could it also be restored as a functional freshwater wetland and a city park? Could it enhance coastal resiliency? Engineering studies were commissioned. The project team that designed the South Wilmington wetland was formed in 2010. Led and funded by the city of Wilmington and Denrec, the team worked with other agencies, nonprofits, and the South Bridge community to plan, design, and permit the wetland park. They persisted through many challenges, including acquiring the property, cleaning it up, modeling the hydrology, developing engineering plans, designing a variety of landscapes, calculating human health and environmental risk assessments, doing public outreach, getting the permits, and raising the funds. Next slide. By 2018, the design and construction plans were finished and $23 million in funding had been raised. The National Fish and Wildlife Foundation contributed 2.6 million to assist with construction. But in addition to building the wetland park, the city of Wilmington will also be separating 36 acres of combined sewer overflow pipes into separate stormwater and sanitary sewer systems. When it rains, the water will flow through the new stormwater pipes and into the restored wetland where it will be held and gradually released into the Christina River. Separating out the stormwater will create capacity in the existing sanitary sewer pipes that flow to the city's wastewater treatment plant, and it will prevent flooding in half of the Southbridge neighborhood. Next slide. The wetland park itself will have trails, including a wide ADA accessible boardwalk and on-grade pathway to increase local walkability and recreational opportunities. And the main trail will provide the Southbridge community with walking access to jobs and shopping in the developed riverfront areas to the west. Next slide. In pressure, preparation for construction, next slide please. The wetland was sprayed with herbicide to kill Phragmites and the dried stalks were chopped and mulched. In 2019, construction began on the 22 acre phase one section. The first major activity was to excavate 110,000 cubic yards of soil to create the marsh plain channels and upland island areas. Several small contaminated hotspots of soil were disposed off-site. The rest was reused to, as fill to close out an old industrial pond at the former Claymont Steel Facility only eight miles away. Next slide. The base of a future road was constructed. Next slide. The new wetland, will be connected to the Christina River at two points and flushed twice daily by the tides. The primary connection is through the A Street Ditch, an area that contained PCBs in the sediments. And you can see it at the green arrow there in the middle. A remediation was needed to prevent contaminants from flowing back into the restored wetland. Next slide. The ditch was temporarily dewatered, the sediments were mucked out and clean stone was placed. 
Gabion baskets filled with stone were used to stabilize the walls. Next slide. But before this happened, PCB sampling was performed by collecting sediment and also using passive absorbent samplers. Next. Where the ditch flowed into the Christina River, Denrick and Brightfields applied pelletized activated carbon treated with PCB degrading bacteria. These materials will remain in the ditch sediments and continue to break down residual PCBs. Next. Activated carbon was also applied along the edge of the adjacent low-level PCB landfill. Next, and in the channel closest to the A Street ditch. The marsh plain was hydro seeded in, last, in late winter of last year. Next, and the uplands were topsoiled and seeded. Next, shrubs and trees were planted and began to grow. The boardwalk was constructed. The park landscape features were really starting to take shape. But behind what the future visitors will see is significant engineering infrastructure that creates the water circulation between the wetland and the river, which is so essential to flood mitigation and the fish and wildlife habitat creation. Next slide. A second, a second piped connection to the river was added on the east side of the wetland. Next. A head wall was built where the pipe entered the river and pilings and foundations were constructed to support the automatic gate valves that will control tidal flow and water levels. The wetland park plans to open to the public this summer. Phase two of the wetland park, you see it looks bigger here than at the beginning, will bring it to around 50 acres total. It's currently being designed, but the land still remains to be acquired. The city and DelDOT need in the range of an additional $40 million to complete phase two of the wetland park and the tree-lined Southern Boulevard. So if anybody listening is interested in helping with phase two, Wilmington and Delaware are interested in talking to you. The Delaware Nature Society started an urban youth nature education program and is training trail ambassadors to teach environmental concepts to residents and visitors. Next. The restoration of the Wilmington Wetland Park was based on years of environmental testing to understand contaminant concentrations on the land and in the river. So now I'd like to turn it over to John Cargill from Denrick to talk about the WATAR program and the plans for cleaning up the sediments in our rivers. Thank you very much, Marion, and uh, thank you all for sticking with us today to hear the end of this talk. And I'm excited actually to, to get to uh, talk a little bit about our WATAR program uh, and specifically a CBR4 project uh, that is going on in the area that Marion's just been discussing. Now, WATAR uh, does stand for a Watershed Approach to Toxics Assessment and Restoration. And this is a program that I manage with a colleague uh, and we both work in different sections uh, of DENREC at this point. Uh, the two sections involved are, are the Watershed Assessment and Management section. And, and that program deals with 303D listings, total maximum daily load, uh, determination, and, and essentially clean water uh, for, for fish as, as well as other benthic aquatic life. Uh, it's driven by Clean Water Act regulation, uh, which isn't quite the same as, as the other side of WATAR, which is, is through our Hazardous Substance Cleanup Act program, um, our remediation section within DENREC. Uh, which is modeled after a RECRA program, but uh, that program has the authority to clean up uh, contaminated sites. It's where you hear a lot of the Brownfield talk uh, that goes in our DENREC Hazardous Substance Cleanup Act program. So you put the two together, we found that we have the same goals, but we go about it a different way. And the WATAR program is our attempt to bring that together. We focus primarily on persistent bioaccumulative and toxic compounds, things like PCBs that stick around for a long time and you've heard a lot about today. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit more in the rest of these slides. Uh, but one of the hallmarks of the WATAR program is linking sources of contamination to the sinks. And in this case, when we say a sink, we really do mean the waterways uh, at where these sediments go and live uh, the rest of their days unless we step in and do something about it. And we can clean up every source we want to, there's still some contamination left in the river that we have to deal with. And that's what our CBR4 project is really about. Next slide, please. Uh, it's important to note here that the overall goal of DENREC's WATAR program is to achieve a fishable, swimmable, uh, and potable status for our surface waters in the shortest time frame possible. 
And what that really means to us is we need to know what we have. Uh, we need to know where we can step in to try to enhance or accelerate uh, recovery. And we need to know when, when enough is enough and we need, let to, need to let nature take its course. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things we started with, and this, uh, this was mentioned earlier in a talk, uh, if you recall in Camden, the, the landfill that was uh, generating six grams of PCBs per day or, or discharging that to the river. We're going to call that a load to the river. And, and one of the things that Denrek Watar program started with and how we really kind of got started was looking at mass loading or PCB loading from contaminated sites. Uh, Denrek hired Brightfields uh, to do this assessment for us back in 2009, and we did a, a, a phase two of the, the project in 2015, where all of the files were mined for detections of PCBs, uh, mass loading calculations were conducted, and we were able to see pretty holistically then where our largest loaders uh, to our water bodies were. And in this case, we're, we're looking at the Christina River. Um, again, by, by having this list, we were able to prioritize and really spend our resources on the, the largest loaders and the worst loaders within the basin uh, to try to achieve our goals even further. Uh, in 2017, uh, I conducted an update to the PCB mass loading uh, report in a sense, just, just by going and saying, where have we remediated? Where have we uh, stopped the loading? And I'm happy to report that, uh, you know, as of 2017, we took our uncontrolled PCB site list from 58 sites down to 22. Uh, and when we calculate all the loads and the differences uh, from the cleanup projects, uh, we had an almost 50% reduction in our loading. Uh, and, and this is working on all sites. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, what we were able to do with, with this assessment is come up with a priority list, and we call it our top 10 list. Uh, you can see that there are still a few sites on our top 10 list, including the top three. Uh, and these are Amtrak, former Amtrak sites or, or current Amtrak sites uh, that have a lot of PCB contamination. Uh, you'll see in the yellow text here, we do have final plans of remedial action for some of those sites, or we have remedial investigations that are complete and we're working towards cleanup plans for those other sites. You'll see number five here was the South Wilmington Wetland Park, uh, and that one is near completion, uh, as Marion has, has shown. Um, again, these other sites uh, were our, our higher loading sites, and most of them we have a good handle on or are working towards controlling. Next slide, please. Uh, another facet of our WATAR program is, is a comprehensive sampling effort. Um, each year we would go into several different watersheds over the course of, I think, six or seven years. It took us to cover all of them. In 2015, we did the Christina Basin, uh, which has the Christina River in it. Um, and these are all of our sample sites. Uh, you see we did 65 sediment samples, 25 surface water samples, and 25 fish tissue samples, many of which were co-located, uh, which really kind of helped us from a scientific standpoint know what we're dealing with. Uh, the results of the assessment here are shown in, in really the green, yellow, and red uh, dots, not to get into the weeds on it, are really just comparing to applicable standards. Red is much worse than green, and we can very quickly focus in on, on areas of concern. Uh, next slide, please. Now, part of, of, of the whole idea of reducing loading uh, to a river isn't just related to waste sites. When we calculate total maximum daily loads, we have to consider things like industrial discharges that are permitted. We have to consider stormwater uh, discharges uh, and what that stormwater contains. Uh, even CSOs uh, are, are sources for loading to the river. And we partnered with a lot of our, our local areas, municipalities, in this case, uh, the city of Wilmington, uh, to do some track back studies and find where within their wastewater treatment plant system, uh, we were getting higher loads of PCBs. And through those efforts, uh, in, in an approximate 10 year period, and it's probably even better now, uh, the city of Wilmington was able to reduce its PCB load by greater than 90%. 
again, some of that is, is identifying sources and, and utilizing our resources in our uh, regulatory authorities to clean up those sources. In many cases, we found that uh, it was related to uh, old legacy releases and the, the sediment in the bottom of the pipe um, was the source and a continuing source. And once those were cleaned out and the sediments were disposed of, the loading coming through the pipe was, was much, much less. So an interesting little facet to uh, what we're doing there. Next slide, please. Uh, obviously, one of the things or the metrics that we can use um, to, to determine whether we're meeting our goals or we're making progress uh, is to measure PCBs in the fish tissue. Uh, this is a plot of uh, fish tissue concentrations of PCBs collected right at Walnut Street, right at the end uh, of where the project that Marion is discussing uh, in some of our remedial efforts are are taking place. And what's most important to note is that between about the 2007 timeframe and 2015, the last time this was sampled, we had a, a, a great, great reduction uh, in PCB concentrations in fish tissue. And we're attributing that to the, the programs like WATAR and the partnerships we've created and, and just paying attention to source control uh, in all facets, uh, and again, trying to eliminate sources through our NIPTES MS4 discharges and our waste site loadings. Next slide, please. Bringing a lot of this together and to kind of bring it into the CBR4 project, which is, that stands for Christina and Brandywine River Remediation, Restoration and Resilience Project. Uh, this, the, the slide here shows our, our project area, basically. Uh, we have had a bathymetric survey conducted in this area of the river by one of our partners. Uh, the, the big uh, purple area in the middle there you can see is the South Wilmington Wetland Project. Um, and it and some of the surrounding sites there were probably the largest source of PCBs to this area of the river. Now you see the little blue boxes uh, that are scattered about this map. Those were all properties that were identified through our initial PCB mass loading analysis as having some sort of contribution of PCBs from the watershed to the river. Um, so it really, you can kind of get a, a sense of how we're trying to pull everything together and take care of our sources before we get in the river and actually try to perform a sediment remediation. Uh, next slide, please. And so, you know, the question, why are we going about the CBR4 project now? Uh, I've just told you we still have some sources out there to deal with. Uh, well, the idea is, just like you've heard all these talks today, is we start to plan on parallel paths. We, uh, we have obtained funding and are moving forward with a feasibility study uh, for remediating sediments in our project area. Uh, we will continue to identify uh, data gaps and collect data where we need to to know where our highest levels of PCBs remain. While that's going on, we're also partnering with other folks and through some, some other grants and other funding sources uh, going about uh, coastal resilience and restoration planning. So when we do get to uh, you know, the time when we can do in-river remediation, we can try to combine all the goals, uh, combine restoration efforts with remediation efforts if we can, and also compel, uh, just like all of our other speakers today have talked about, compel others to potentially do something good with their projects if they're working on projects. So we anticipate this is gonna take a long time, but we're well on our way. Uh, and we're even conducting very innovative and state-of-the-art pilot studies to, uh, to see if and how we can remediate the sediments uh, even faster or better in the long run. Uh, next slide. And this is where I give it back to Marion. Yeah, so uh, if, if you can just um, think about how much money it must take to do all these uh, types of cleanups and restorations, and I know you're all looking at the same type of thing, it's a real challenge, but we feel like John said, we are on our way. We have already received um, $250,000 to get started with a restoration planning grant through the Christina Conservancy and American Rivers. And DENREC has is, is funded the feasibility study um, to begin figuring out what the actual ways are to clean up these sections of the river sediments. Next slide. So in summary, uh, as part of the CBR4 project, we plan to not only remediate the contaminated river sediments, but to create other wetland parks along the Christina and Brandywine rivers. 
And like the Southbridge residents and business owners you see here, Marvin Thomas and Marie Reed, who were super involved in the South Wilmington wetland, every step of the process from initial concept to construction kickoff, other Wilmington neighbors will participate in environmental restoration projects near their homes and businesses. Last slide. As we work, we'll all keep in the forefront of our minds the goals of the WATAR program, fishable, swimmable, potable surface water in the shortest time frame possible. Thank you. Glad we could fit it in. <laughs> Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Marion and John. And um, I'm a big thank you again to you know, all of our speakers today. Those were some fantastic presentations, lots of you know, really great projects that each of the cities are working on. Um, and thank you to the you know, 100 people that were tuned in today and the 60 plus that are still hanging with us for this two hour webinar today. Um, we are several minutes past two o'clock. Um, so you know, I do want to be conscious of everyone's time. So you know, what we're planning to do is following this webinar series, um, we're going to send out some follow-up emails to all of the attendees with some additional information. Um, and we can you know, work on getting some of those questions answered um, that have come in through the Q&A box um, that we didn't really have a time to get to on the webinar today. You know, We did get some really good questions coming in so we can kind of work on getting some of those responses typed up and sent out to folks. And I'm gonna share, I have one, one more slide with a couple quick updates. Hey, Emily, while you're doing that, I would just mention to the group that, um, you know, as part of our Urban Water Federal Partnership planning and meetings, so uh, we'll be sending out more information, you know, so in the future we could have, uh, you know, some more discussion time, you know, to talk about these projects as examples, talk about funding, talk about new projects, you know, uh, just, just continue the discussion um, the uh, the agenda was probably ambitious to have uh, much you know discussion anyway, uh, but we definitely are going to seek out you know additional participation and discussion. And, and thanks again to all the presentations; they they were just fantastic as usual. Great, thanks, Simeon. Yeah, so we do have we have one more webinar coming up um, as part of this you know virtual Brownfields and Environmental Justice Communities of Practice series. We'll drop the registration down in the chat uh, one more time again for registration there. And this third webinar will um, be next week again on Thursday, April 8th, same time, noon to two o'clock. And we're gonna have some presentations on several environmental justice community initiatives that are taking place across the different urban water cities. And then we are also working on a fourth webinar that will focus on affordable housing and infrastructure, hoping to kind of nail down a date for that webinar in the next week or so. Um, so stay tuned for more information on that very soon most likely to take place sometime in May. And um, last, you know, we mentioned this at the beginning of the webinar, our urban waters location, you know, we're in the process of creating an updated work plan. Um, and we welcome feedback from all of you on some of our future priorities. You know, we're gonna go ahead and link that online feedback form in the chat again right now. Um, so, you know, we're looking for input from folks that, you know, live and work in our area and how this urban waters location can really add value to this region. And we're accepting feedback on that um, online form through April 9th. And thanks again for everyone for attending today's webinar. And we do hope to see you again next Thursday for our third webinar in this series. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>